one second here. Just getting started with a different platform tonight, so if you can just give me two seconds so we get situated. Sorry for the delay. Gotcha. Off there and put this on over here, and I think we're about ready to get situated. Nope, that's not the one I need. And... So I'm going to go ahead and click on over here and then we can go ahead and get situated so we can go ahead and get started. Everyone's ready to rock and roll. So anyways, my name is Jermaine McDougall and, and as most of you already know me, I'm just going to give you a really quick brief introduction to what we got going on for tonight. Um, like I said, it's always a pleasure to have each and every one of you guys here uh, with us in these particular, I should say, events that we got going on, our webinar series. Um, hopefully the long weekend was great for those of us who had an opportunity to have yesterday a bank holiday. And so hopefully that was uh, beneficial for most for most of you for the most part, at least to get the energies going on so we can get situated for the most part for the rest of the week, what's left of it uh, four days if that's it. So like I said, once again, my name is Jermaine McDougall. I want to welcome you guys to the Facebook Live or webinar series uh, sponsored by the Masters in English Language Teaching for Autonomous Learning Environments and the Masters in English Language Teaching for Self-Directed Learning. Um, well, as you know, we have been providing you with a series of webinars uh, throughout the month of May uh, and also throughout the month of June. Uh, and pretty much we've been covering a whole bunch of topics and ideas related to what we've got going on here nowadays um, in terms of language teaching and things of that nature. Uh, what can I say? Well, it's, these are opportunities for us, for you, for, um, so we can get a, I should get an opportunity to interact with some of our, I should say, professors in the program. But not aside from interacting with our professors in the program, gives us an opportunity to get to know each other as well. Uh, it's about um, building a community. It's about working together in terms of networking and things of that nature. So I think these are opportunities for us to actually get to know each other. Uh, just kind of, you know, take away some of the formalities that we have and do some other things as well. Yeah. Well, but the idea is to be on the lookout because we have a couple of more weeks left in June. Uh, last week's session was uh, had to be canceled due to some technical technicalities. Uh, we will be re, uh, reorganizing, resetting, uh, putting up another date. So please be on the lookout for that in that particular instance. Yeah. Uh, what else can I say? Keep just a couple of things just for reminders. Uh, the idea is that these faces are designed for you. So please do not hesitate to ask any questions or comments and things of that nature, uh, as well as interacting with us uh, while we are uh, working together. Uh, the idea is all about sharing experiences, uh, your experiences, our experiences as well. Remember to use the chat box just in the case you have any questions or comments about what we got going on. Um, this is interactive, so like I said again, Anna Maria and I, we have about four to five questions, six questions prepared for you. Hopefully you, you will like it, but once again, you can interact and you can stop us along the way just in case it's necessary. Huh? Once the session is complete, we'll be uploading the information as always to our Unisavana ELT fan page as well as the um, as well as the I should say the the web page that we have with all this information so you have an opportunity to to look at the, the session again, share it with some others, etc. OK, uh, we do hope you do will enjoy the experience because we have lots of things in, in store for you tonight. Uh, what can I say? We're going to be talking, um, introducing you to Anna Maria. Uh, tonight's session is going to be based on talking about, I should say, um, teaching English to young learners. Uh, throughout the session, um, throughout the session, we're going to be talking about quite a few things. And so I hope that uh, well, we hope not just me, but uh, we hope that the session is going to be uh, beneficial to each and every one of you in hopes of, you know, trying to, to to ensure that the sessions are, I should say, beneficial and they work well for everyone. I would please I would ask you if you would mind uh, muting your microphones if that's possible. Uh, mute your microphones that way we don't have enough, you know, uh, it, it allows us to cut down on the feedback, cut down on all the extra information and things that nature that we've got going on out there in that particular instance yeah um so i think without further ado what i'm going to be doing i'm going to be posting the uh, i should say the information inside the text box in terms of anna maria's um bio data and things of that nature uh as you know because Anna maria is is well experienced in, in terms of bilingualism well experienced in terms of uh, teaching as a young learners uh by far she doesn't need a, a very long i should say uh a, a generous, I should say, um, uh, introduction. I will be pasting it in here inside the text box. But like I said again, um, I think if you're ready, Anna, I think we're going to get situated. Yeah, so far so good. 
What do you think? Sure, um, whenever. Um, yeah. Whatever you say, yeah, you're the whenever. boss. No, no, no. I'm just here. I'm just here, you know, as an innocent bystander, you know, just trying to uh, connect a few dots together. Um, just give me two seconds here. Let me go ahead and share the screen. We're using a yeah, different we platform all believe you. for this. We all huh? believe you. <laughs> we all believe you. Yeah. Of course, of course, Anna. You got to love it. Got to love it. So we're going to get situated and I'm going to go ahead and start it. And here we are. So um, there we go. Let me know if you can see the screen. It should be popping up any time now. OK, very good. Yes, sir. And I'm going to make this a bit bigger so we can all get a chance to see. OK. There we go. So uh, to get started, uh, if you want to go ahead, maybe say a few words, Anna, while I go ahead and stick the, the, the survey there. If you want to say hi and say a few things, give me two seconds here really fast. Go ahead. Sure. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you here on this, at least here in close to Bogota, very, very chilly afternoon. It's great to see you all. I have quite a few uh, colleagues from other uh, workplaces who have joined us. It's great to see you. And um, even alumni from when my Warren and I worked at a school. So um, I hope we'll be able to share some ideas about teaching English to young learners. I am currently working here at the University Universidad de La Sabana in the Department of Foreign Languages and Cultures. I teach in the in both master's programs and in the face-to-face um, -face program, which obviously became an online program. I um, teach a, the subject called teaching English to young learners. So as we go along, as Jermaine said, Please, please feel free to um, put questions, comments in the chat. We want to hear from you. And if you'd like, go ahead and um, answer the survey, the survey that is in the chat um, to uh, so that we can get an idea of who is here in the audience. How many of you do teach young learners? So if you could just take a two seconds, a few seconds, uh, we just put a poll out there. I don't know if you can see it again. So if you stick a poll, that would be so grateful. Just kind of slide up and uh, well, just get some ideas. We're trying to interact and do something a bit different during the session tonight. So it would be great if you can just maybe answer the question. So it's a simple yes or no. Uh, do you or, or not uh, are currently teaching? And just get some ideas of how we can actually start the conversation in that particular instance. You can vote. OK, so let's can just try it again. So why don't we do this in order to move forward? I think we're going to do something else, Anna, because I think we maybe have some difficulties because of the, but that's all right. I've got another one. So, you know, there's always a plan B. So I'm going to go ahead and stick this poll, which is a different one. This is Google, because unfortunately, I think the poll is connected to the institutional email addresses, which is probably telling you you cannot um, do something. But just in the case, if you would mind, just maybe give me some ideas there. There's a Google Doc, and then in a few minutes, we're going to go ahead and just display those results, get really fast with you. OK. Maricela, thanks a lot. OK. OK. So we get about another maybe a minute or so and we're going to go ahead and move forward. Uh, the link, if you didn't get it, it's right here. Just in case you need to get it again. Go ahead. Thank you, Mary. Nubia. Christian. OK, gotcha, done, done, super. OK, 
So looks like we're here so far, Anna. Looks like about 70, just like the majority of our, our crowd, 72%, we are actually uh, teaching English to young learners. At the moment, we have about 19 responses. If we can continue there, we can keep going, keep, keep them coming in. How much longer do you want to wait, Anna, so we can go ahead and give me some ideas so I can... Did you want I me think to share that screen with start. you as well? Yeah, you want me to, did you want me can... to share the, the results or no? No, that's fine. I think no? that just okay. knowing that there's a large group of um, experienced teachers of learning learners is going to help me move this along. And also, I'd really like to invite you to share your experiences because I'm sure that we can all learn from each other. So I think we can go ahead and start with the next slide. Okay, there are about 75% of us that are actually teaching nowadays. So let's go with the next slide. So with that in mind, Anna, we're going to get some ideas. It's going to be more of a conversation, and I wanted to get some ideas about what makes teaching young learners especially challenging and rewarding. As you know, you know, young learners, they're, they are, um, I should say, a group of individuals, or not individuals, but students, learners, that we have to, once again, pay, pay special attention to. We have other things we have to consider. Um, some of us, we have the, I should say, the chip in order to be, you know, uh, uh, to teach young learners. Other of us, we are far away from it. Uh, we need things like patience. We need lots of things going on. What do you think that, um, what makes this particular, I should say, population challenging and rewarding? What can you give us right. some ideas about? Sure, while I'm talking, I'd also like the, um the audience to chat to write in the chat uh, what they consider makes young learners especially challenging and rewarding because we do know as uh, teachers of of young learners the children are all unique and wonderful they're curious about the world they're eager to learn they're active they enjoy playing exploring they do have short attention spans and are easily distracted they learn holistically from concrete, familiar experiences and at different rhythms. They learn best when they can establish connections, when they feel safe and comfortable, and they perceive that the adults around them care for them and also care about them. Although they have natural limitations in their experience and their use of language, both native and foreign language, young children are natural language acquirers. They are self-motivated to pick up language without conscious learning. So teaching English to young learners is an adventure, a marvelous and enriching opportunity. And of course, while we're uh, saying this, I'm sure you're all um, thinking to yourselves, well, yeah, that was great <laughs> until we faced <laughs> this situation. So what about uh, online? Okay. So what do you think? What do you think? Uh, like you said again, Anna Maria, I don't know if we have a couple of ideas coming in. So as this um, Christian is saying, it's a multi-level factor. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure, they need to be connected with the teacher as well as motivated. That is a big one. Nubia, right. thank you so much for, for, for uh, giving us some ideas. Anybody else wanted to write something? Because you were pretty quiet. We were pretty quiet so far. They need lots of one-on-one. -on -one. Angie, thank you so much. Yes, they are. Lots of one-on-one -on -one support. And like I said again, this is a very unique population, very unique population, but very rewarding at the end of the day. But like Anna Maria said, she's just actually, she, she brought up another quote. What about online? Because as, as of now, we are we are facing, dealing with, and I should say having to manage uh, the same type of population, but now in a different type of environment. That environment nowadays is online. What, what are some thoughts or ideas that you can give to us now considering uh, online learning uh, for this type of population? Right. I want to point out that Alejandra, welcome. How are you? Keeping keeping them focused on the screen okay, and the yeah, activities. Yeah. Yes, great. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Very Angelica, good. Connection okay, comes so. first. Yeah. And now, thank you. Great to see you here. Uh, well, you know, we've been recently forced to confront this new challenge, and teachers all over the world are uh, transforming their practices to face this new reality. They're already doing lots of things to tackle the diverse and very particular context they're working in. In the words of Ken Beatty, they are doing three things, basically. Looking for solutions, improving their skill sets, especially with technology, and working with and learning from others. This is what we're already doing. If you could um, please change to the next slide, here are some sure. ideas that might be useful in this endeavor. The first one I think is just natural to teachers. Be prepared and be creative. As you always do, plan diligently and manage time carefully. 
build community becomes a huge challenge because of the limitations of distance learning, but we can encourage group work and interactions in the synchronous sessions and outside of them as well involve parents, peers, and other family members if possible. It's not always possible, but if you can, it gives us this sense that we are still a community even though we are distanced. Remember that we're all learning, teachers, students, and parents. As in our face-to-face -face teaching, set expectations for behavior, promote autonomy and independence, and involve students in different ways. And again, I'm sure you're hearing echoes of things that you already do in your face-to-face -face classroom. Reach out. Make the most of free online resources and what is shared on social media. Now, I must say that I've um, become very, very reconciled with Facebook. I'm, I was not a big fan, but it's amazing <laughs> what people are sharing and um, what you can learn from everything that's that's out there. So I would I, I would recommend, if you're not a big Facebook fan, to, um, to give it a try again, because really, uh, it's been amazing. Keep activities short, varied, and engaging. We'll talk a little bit more about that ahead, but it seems obvious, right? Kids um, enjoy variety and, and certainly things that are engaging. Think outside the box. In many cases, our schools are fortunate enough to have students who can connect uh, to the internet and have both the devices and the connectivity, but you, may not, you might not have that and you might not always want to use it. So uh, thinking outside the box to look for other resources, phones, photocopies, yes, letters, radio, television, posters, a graffiti, chalk or um, paint on sidewalks or walls if that's possible. It looks like uh, many other uh, environments could be conducive to learning English if we don't have the um, if we don't have the connection or the devices. Because in some families, what we've heard is they've got the connection, but they've got one or two computers and maybe three kids or two or three kids plus parents also working. So it's, it becomes really really difficult. Um, relax and have fun. It's hard for kids to relax and have fun if the teacher is really, really nervous and, and worried about things going wrong. Things will go wrong. It can happen. But it also happens in your face-to-face -face class. And what do you do? You laugh at it, you overcome it, and you're just more natural because of it. So um, try to relax and have fun and know that uh, this too shall pass and we'll be able to learn from our mistakes and learn from things that, that happen. Perhaps the most important thing, though, is take care of yourself. We can't take care of others, our children, our students, if we don't take care of ourselves. So um, it is important to take into account that online teaching is not the same as face-to-face -face teaching. However, it's also important to note that um, they both should be grounded in the same solid, meaningful, relevant pedagogical principles. The University of Massachusetts in its manual for teaching and learning online quotes Reagan by, say, by stating, Reagan and it's not the president, uh, by stating that it is helpful to remember that in any environment, good teaching is good teaching. And I know from firsthand experience with many of the people who are here in the audience that you are good teachers. And I'm sure that reflects clearly in your um, online work as well. Anything else that you'd like to add there, Jermaine? No, no, I, th I think you've said it most of all, but I just want to go back to the first point where you talked about um, uh, being prepared and creative. Preparation is key, and lots of times what I find is that um, the issues are not necessarily related to um, all the extra things that we have that are around us. I see some people in the chat box are talking about how parents are uh, involved, which is great. Others are saying that the parents are involved, but it's way too much, so it's, it becomes something negative. But like I said again, um, this is all new to all of us, and I think part of that preparation, Anna Maria, is about knowing what to do when I do have parents, you know, looking in the screen like this, or when I do have the little brothers and the sisters right next to him or her, you know, pushing or, or trying to do some other things as well. Uh, by, by being prepared, there should always be a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C. And sometimes we go to a plan D, yeah? Especially when we're talking about online learning and things of that nature, and when we're talking about young learners. But I think it's, it's interesting there. But you also bring up another point about relax and have fun. Because like I said again, 
we're going to make mistakes like we made mistakes before, or we're going to probably make mistakes here now in this online environment as well. But like I said again, we have to understand that they are kids. We have to understand that they have, I should say, a capacity in terms of um, a not learning, but I should say their attention span is quite short. So when I am planning and when I am preparing uh, and my expectations for their behavior, these are some of the things that I should consider and I should always have I should say in mind. Uh, lots of times when I, I'm listening and, and paying attention these last few months about what's going on in the classrooms, I've observed even a couple of classrooms as well. And it's interesting because, well, I've seen teachers without a plan B. You know, uh, and, and even if I go to the preschool, K4, K5, et cetera, in my regular face to face class, I need to have a plan A. I need to have a plan B and have a plan C. Online learning and teaching is not anything different. It, it's about this. It, well, I will not say it's not the same, but we also need to once again have those same types of things in play. But no, just to get, you know, complement a few things in that particular ideas. And like I said, again, uh, activities are short, varied and engaging. Why? Because their attention span is short. So I need to have something that caters to what they're capable of doing. I need to have something that caters and organized to what they got going on. So what do I do about the nosy parents, Anna Maria? What do you think about that? Because I had a couple of comments here talking about parents. I shouldn't say nosy. Nosy brings on a, I should say, a negative connotation. And I should say maybe concerned citizens, yeah? Concerned parents that are in the classrooms want to figure out what's going on. Uh, they will be there, uh, but like I said again, what can we do about them? Because I have quite a few questions that came in uh, in the text box, you know, worrying about what do I do with the parents that show up in my class, interrupt my class? Sure, and that's definitely a, a very, very real concern, especially with young learners. But I think that one thing that we have to pay very careful attention to is that if our lives were turned upside down, well, parents, they did a double, triple flip because, well, in a different media, but we are teaching. We're doing what we're trained to do, sometimes with our own kids in the background making noise and needing our attention as well. But parents are doing something that they are just not used to. They were not trained yeah. for. Uh, they're having to support their kids, especially little ones, in, in this um, learning process. So I think we have to understand. And one thing I think that helps a lot is communication, because then we okay. can actually um, make visible parents' concerns and, and you know what they feel they have to do. And um, I think that the other thing is that we also um, share our expectations for behavior for what should happen in the classroom with them and help them to, to know that it's a good idea for kids sometimes to make mistakes, to let them do things on their own and try at least try to do them on their own so that we can see how they're doing. I think that what we see here is is really parents totally overwhelmed and we have to understand that and try to address that as best we can. They're doing the best that they can do and so are we. So I think that what we have to do is try to get on common ground and see ultimately what we want is the best for their kids. And at this point, we really have to listen to these things that are um, very, very real to them and very, um, very, very overwhelming. They are biting off a lot more than they can chew and um, and it is part of the process and we do really have to see how we can help them through it because it's just not easy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for, for that for that part. And be like, um, like I said again, parents are a very vital part of what we got going on in terms of education, not just uh, young learners, but they're a very vital part and communication is key. And I, I do agree with you about sharing those, as you say, expectations regarding behaviors, uh, learned behaviors and, and expected behaviors in terms of classroom in a different stages and moments. But like I said again, communication is key. So that's a good thing there. So a uh, kind of shifting a bit more to something else, shifting a bit more in terms of um, how can we promote and sustain young learners interest in learning English? Because as you know, many of them are still trying to develop, organize and even acquire their first language, which is a challenge. In addition to that, you know, they're trying to have fun and I'm trying to be serious. Sometimes, you know, our, you know, our, I should say goals and objectives are not always the same in the classroom, but at the end of the day, you know, I am trying to do my best in order to engage them to maintain their interest in terms of learning English. What are some tips, ideas uh, that you can actually give us in that particular instance? Okay, well, we've said the kids love to learn and it's important to capitalize on that by using strategies that engage and interest them. Use of songs, games, stories, rhymes, props. How about bringing a puppet to class? Just saying. 
a, many opportunities to explore, use their senses and move around. That's really, really important, especially in this situation where everybody is, is a, in lockdown, not being able to go outside. So, and kids really need, they're active and they need to be able to, to move around. The use of gestures, charades, visual prompts and actions, along with the prudent use of their na native language will help set students to make sense of that new other language that they are learning. When teachers identify and work with students' needs, interests, support them emotionally, respect the differences, kids will try to do their best, develop the required skills, their critical thinking, and their creativity. It's ju not just a matter of triggering the motivation, which the puppet can do, but as Dornier says, maintaining directed motivational currents or flow. How do we keep that going and ensuring the learning and the growth? How about um, the audience? Would you like to share some of your strategies for promoting and sustaining your learners' interests? I'm sure you do many, many interesting things. So if you don't mind, take a few minutes. And like I said, again, we're trying, you're trying, we, we would love to hear from you. And so uh, give me some ideas. What do you think about this? How can we promote and sustain your young learners' interest in, in, in terms of English? What are you doing nowadays in your classroom? Uh, what's taking place? Um, so maybe some examples, because like I said at the beginning of our little talk, uh, this is about sharing. Uh, about you know com uh, sharing you know uh, best practices like experiences things that we got going on so so Maricela uh, games in terms of competitions thank you much so much Maricela sure who else wants to give some ideas apps like Kahoot awesome songs Certainly. great job songs okay retos challenges Angelica yes totally they love to participate in those types of activities okay rituals activities that they can actually uh, anticipate okay or even be a part of thank you so yes. much Edna okay thank you Edna we'll be talking a bit about that rituals and routines storytelling so storytelling okay awesome contests intangible rewards such as actually starts okay very very good super thank you so much angie images okay movement activities songs and games again okay sharing their toys and crafts of course i i do we are we still doing a lot of what we call show and tell yeah, that used to be my favorite, even as a teacher, uh, as a student as well. I would just love to come and show and tell every Friday, get something. You know, I get my 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 five minutes of fame, I should say, to do some things. So that's always a good thing. Tell jokes, simple mimes. OK, good, good. All right, what else we got going on here? So I got the puppets. I um, OK, so we laugh with them respectfully, of course, not at them, but we laugh with them. Very good. Uh, once again, role modeling and, and, and by laughing with them, you, you provide them with a role model. Uh, thank you so much, Mary. Puppets, changing rules, OK, manual activities, hands on type things, comics. So you see, as you can see here, we got lots of good things in order to help maintain and, and I should engage them inside the classroom. Uh, lots of times, you know, um, well, I shouldn't say lots of times uh, they are at an age where, you know, they are able to absorb acquire it do so much more and and by allowing us to use language as a as a way in order to get to them in order to spark that interest in order to to see so they can see that you know the little light bulb to go on above it's really good because it actually sticks with them they go home and they actually practice you know <laughs> they actually go home and do the homework they actually want to do it by themselves they go home and they they're all inquisitive about making videos and, and painting faces and, and doing all kinds of things interviewing moms and dads interviewing their grandparents for example recording short videos Videos. So they do lots of things, I should say, that um, can engage them within the language inside and both outside of the classroom. So thank you. And so I, I have some other ones here, problems in the class, uh, meaningful projects. OK, lots of things going on and challenge them to participate in activities. Super riddles. OK, that they're absurd, uh, funny things. Uh, rewards is always a good thing. Super. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to would you like me to go on with the next one, Anna? Or you do you want to add something else? I just wanted to add that I've also seen many, especially many preschool teachers, actually uh, dressing up for class, using costumes and having kids also dress up and, and use costumes. I think that we know very well that uh, the teachers of uh, young learners are very, very creative. So as you say, Jermaine, the sky's the limit with what you can do with them. I think we can go on. Sure, sure, OK. So with that in mind, um, considering the engaging, because we've already engaged them, now we're going to move on to something else. We're talking about cultures of thinking. How can we create, I should say, a culture of thinking inside the classroom with our young learners? OK, how can we do that? What do you think? 
Um, okay, this is a, a topic that many people in the who are here today know that it's very, very close to my heart. Angela Salmon from Florida International University states that effective teachers are powerful mediators of children's thinking and learning. They design learning activities that stimulate children's curiosity. They also engage children in thinking routines throughout the curriculum to provoke thinking and metacognitive activities. Thus, we become catalysts to make thinking visible. As Ron Richard points out, our classrooms are small little microcultures that reflect, teach, rein and reinforce our beliefs about teaching and learning. If we value thinking, then the expectations we have as a community of learners, the opportunities that we create and engage in, the language we use, the interactions that occur, how we spend time in the classroom and outside of it, the attitudes and behaviors that we model, the routines, as Edna was saying, that occur, and even the physical environment will all contribute to developing a culture of thinking. Harvard's Project Zero proposes the use of thinking routines, which are typically a series of questions that teachers ask children in order to lead them through the steps of critical thinking and to help them understand where their own ideas come from. These routines support children's development as self-directed learners and promote learning for understanding. They help children make connections between the familiar and relevant events in their lives. I'd like to ask the audience if anybody um, has ever heard of thinking routines uh, and if they use them in the classroom. Angelica? Mm -hmm. Mary, great. Giovanna, great to see you. Yes, that's a very good example of a thinking routine. Mm -hmm. Yes, Edna. Think and share or think pair share. Yes. There are tons of them out there. Actually, Project Zero has now has one site where they've put together many, many. A Kata, yes, circle of points of view. Um, and it's called the Thinking Routine Toolbox. And um, there are tons of ideas. So um, well, I, there you will find some resources that I'm going to suggest at the end. But uh, please, um, I would invite you to explore these because it's really, really interesting. And what um, for example, uh, Angela Salmon does in uh, Florida. She's the leader of the thinking, visible thinking um, consortium or whatever that they have in um, in Florida. She does things with little kids with no language, which are absolutely amazing. I'm sure that uh, you'll find lots of interesting things uh, to look at there. If we have a little time uh, towards the end, I'm I'll be happy to share a little bit more about it because I see several people who would be interested in knowing more about it. Um, I think we can go on to the next one unless you have something okay. to to add, Jermaine. No, no. Uh, like I just said, I just you know, um, I think we have quite a few examples we got going on in terms of think thinking routines. But I, I like the idea about creating a culture of thinking in the classroom because lots of times I remember years ago, not lots of times, years ago in in a course, um, a third semester graduate program, I we were talking about autonomous learning environments. We were talking about creating, um, I should say, what we call um, SAMs, okay, and uh, self access materials. And I remember I had a, a group of preschool teachers and primary school teachers. I had about eight women and one, there was one guy. It's interesting, the, 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 the makeup I had. And when we were talking, uh, one of the things that we, we had a very long debate on Saturday was that, you know, my kids are not able to think on their own. My kids don't know how to think. Um, you know, my preschoolers, they don't think. My young learners, they don't think. I tell them what to do and that's that. And I was like, okay. At the time, my kid was about, well, he, he was in primary. And I was like, so you're telling me that my son, you know, he's not able to think? I'm like, no, 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 they, they can't think. They, there's no way they can think. And so what we did, we were trying to design activities and we went through the entire process of coming up with a, uh, I should say, a SAM. 
uh, uh, self access materials for young learners and they were at the beginning of the course. They were a bit astonished because the word was they couldn't do. But as we progressed and started to understand the needs, the differences and all of the, the great things about working with this particular population, uh, they came up with all these cool things we just said. So then they start to realize, OK, wow, so they can think. It's up to me in order to lead them down the path. It's up to me to design materials uh, to have tasks and have activities that actually can engage them in that particular idea. Because if we're not going to engage them, what happens? Well, we continue doing the same thing over and over again. They're not challenged. They're not engaged. There's no real connection between what's going on. And guess what? At the end of the day, we get the same thing. The same unfortunate response, which is they're not able to. They can't. So we have to do something else. We have to do something easy for them. It's not about being easy. I think if we can really create that culture of thinking inside the classroom in terms of the expectations, opportunities, modeling, routines, but you know, setting up these 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 different um, these these cool activities throughout the class, not just on once, but making it a routine. These are strategies making a habit and, and you know, make it habit forming. So they go from kindergarten, they go to first grade, they go to fifth grade, they move on to eighth grade and before long, it's part of their lives. And so it's up to us really to try to instill this culture of thinking from day one, not just wait on someone else to do or we, we think that, you know, it can't be done, but it, it can be. And so it was great to see at the end of this debate after 16 weeks, 16 weeks of organizing materials, they were able to actually develop uh, uh, self access materials that involve thinking routines and once again changing the mindset, which is for me by far the most important the teacher that yes, it can be done. It's up to me to actually think outside of the box, like Anna Maria said in one of our first slides. Uh, do something different, be creative, involve them, engage them, and we can do some other things there. Okay, so um, what about this? How can we enrich our teaching to better address, I should say, specific needs of young learners? Because as we know, young learners, it's a very diverse population, lots of things going on, but how can I enrich my teaching practices? You know, I have, you know, I'm a, I'm a third grade teacher and, and I have some, some, some needs that I have to attend to. What are some tips and ideas that you can actually give me or give us in order to address those specific needs? Sure, I'd like to uh, highlight Catalina Uribe's uh, comment in the chat talking sure. about one of the most powerful thinking routines uh, that I know of, which is what makes you say that it from, you know, from the very, very beginning we have, um, I had a, um, a student whose thesis was on thinking routines and she would say uh -huh. things like, you know, because it's a routine, um, I go out into the uh, playground and I suddenly I'll see somebody looking at somebody else. And, well, what makes you say that? And <laughs> just because I say so is not an answer. <laughs> so yeah, it becomes, as you say, a routine and something that it changes their mindset is so that they're not just repeating vocabulary mindlessly, yeah. but rather thinking about what they're doing and producing the language. Totally, yeah. Totally. Now regarding this question, I definitely think that the best way we can enrich our teaching practice is by being lifelong learners. And I think that everybody here in this um, event knows that because it's uh, Tuesday night, 645, and we're all here. <laughs> so we're obviously aware that that's yeah. very important, not only to continue to enhance our repertoire of uh, teaching skills, approaches, and methods, but we're also modeling for our students what we want for them. That is that constant curiosity that leads us to explore new knowledge and make it our own, developing, if you will, deeper and more sophisticated understandings while constantly formulating more captivating questions that promote even more learning. In this uh, journey of continuous learning though, we have to think about two things. One is reflection, the thinker on the left, and the other is connection. As Donald, as Donald Schoen states, reflection is the center is at the center of understanding what we as professionals actually do. It's what makes a difference between our work being some kind of a routine or technique and really being a professional uh, undertaking. It gives it relevance. On the other hand, being a connected educator allows us to go beyond our personal knowledge to interact with other professionals and participate in the collective construction of knowledge, which is certainly much more powerful. 
the amount of technological resources that we have nowadays allows us to expand our personal learning network immensely. I was wondering if um, everybody in the in the chat could share possibly resources or connections that you have and that you consider useful to enhance your professional development that you could um, share with all of us. Any ideas? So don't be shy. Don't be shy. Like we said a few minutes ago, I mean, we're all we're all doing we're all in this together, and so we learn from each other. Um, there are some really cool strategies we talked about a few minutes ago, and like I said again, uh, the more we open up and communicate and talk to each other, I said the more we can actually we can get out of this. So yeah, just if you can just make Eddie Utopia as one, super. Thanks Anna for starting starting it out, starting us out. Yes, Joanna, responsive classroom is excellent. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Edna, could you spell that out for us? National law. And of course, don't forget your own schools. Sometimes we tend to value things that are done outside, but within our schools, we also have a lot of um, a, a lot of local resources that that we can use. It's not all out there. And of course, my very, very favorite in the world is Twitter. I was introduced to Twitter quite some time ago. And uh, the person who introduced me at a, an ASCD uh, conference was actually a person who um, what she said is like it's like you're having your own research and development team all for you. So uh, feel free, yes, your colleagues, to follow me on Twitter if you would like. You will find that information at the end of um, at the of the presentation. Yes, Angelica, your colleagues, excellent. So take note of those things and then explore them on your own. And of course, at the end, I will provide some resources for you to um, to also take that into account. Yes, thank you, the National Association David. for the Education of Young Children. David, taking into account the context, excellent. Yes, the context is vital. Not everything is for everyone. Exactly. OK, Jermaine, I think we've got time for about one more question. OK, let's go. I think we got one more we can squeeze in. And uh, what about this? How can we foster better learning and autonomy for those young learners and as well as ourselves? How can we how can we do this better in terms of uh, learning and autonomy, autonomous learners uh, trying to instill, foster, etc. Uh, for those young learners as well as for us in, in that particular instance as well? What do you think? OK. Um, Constance Camille, a renowned student of Piaget's, uh, states that autonomy should be the aim of education. She doesn't talk about young learners, older learners, everybody should be uh, educated towards autonomy. And our role as educators is to prepare students to become independent, critical citizens of the world. There's an excellent TED talk by John Stoke where he talks about the importance of choice, care, trust, dialogue, acceptance, and encouragement in the creation of autonomy supportive environments and his talk is excellent and he um, he's actually referring to when he was a kid and uh, nowadays we talk about maker spaces and so he says well we could have called that a maker space but it was actually my dad's garage and how <laughs> creating things and you know just that he wanted a toy um, toy tool set for Christmas and he didn't get a toy tool set for Christmas. He, he actually got real tools and wood and a hammer and a saw and things and that with these elements he was able to he really felt that he was given 
the opportunity to develop his own uh, autonomy. Now, when you think about it, all of these elements help us, everyone, every single individual to grow, thrive, and make a difference of the world, in the world, excuse me. And um, I think that one of my students in the course that just finished it put it very, very well. He said, learning about how to teach young children is really useful. We can apply what we learned no matter what age our students are. And I like that a lot because he doesn't teach young children, but he was in the young children's course. And um, I really like the way that he uh, was able to see that those elements are vital no matter what age you teach. However, I think that one thing we don't want to forget is that autonomy and independence do not contradict the concept of learning as a social endeavor. Opportunities for interaction and cooperation are indispensable for the cognitive and social development of our citizens of the world. And they go together. It, it, because you have cooperative, collaborative work interaction, you're not sacri necessarily sacrificing autonomy. And vice versa, autonomy is not learning on your own. Sometimes people define it that way, and that's not correct. It's rather it's being able to make decisions about your learning. And many times those decisions are, hmm, I'm not totally sure how to do this. Maybe I need some help. Maybe that help can be a peer. It can be a sibling. It can be a teacher. It can be a parent. So um, that's really, really important to take into account when we consider a autonomy as a vital aim of education. Okay, we're about coming to the end of um, okay. our time here, and I'd just like to share in the following um, a slide. Sure, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> Don't worry, we're good. There you go. Um, I'm going to post a link, which is right there. It's in the presentation, which you will be receiving, but I'm also going to uh, put it in the chat, a link to um, the resources and references. I didn't want to take up a ton of, of slides with resources and references, but here's the link. And I also want to share a wonderful story with you. We currently have a project in... Um, the university working with the public sector and we were very concerned about this situation for teachers who um, you know in primary schools in the public sector the teachers often don't know English and so they have a lot of difficulty teaching English but they must do it so uh, with a group of colleagues um, one of them is actually here in the audience um, we wrote a manual to help teachers teach English to young children in uh, this emergency remote situation. Um, it's, a, it's still a preliminary version. We haven't published it yet, but we are very, very happy to share it with you. So um, if you'd leave your, um, if you could please leave your email address in the chat, we're, I'm happy to send you this copy. The idea is that you can use it share it and um, give us feedback and suggestions. We're, we're really, really looking forward to seeing what happens when people put these things into, um, into practice and uh, let us know if it works, if you have any additional suggestions before we um, were finally able to produce uh, a definitive version of the manual in um, probably in a virtual version. So, um, so well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I think we can open it up maybe to a couple of questions. And always sure. remember, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much, Anna Maria. Awesome. Well, lots of lots of uh, good tips and ideas related to how we can engage our, our young learner population. 
activities, um, working together, communication, uh, learning from each other, learning from them, uh, considering them as individuals and, and not just as uh, subjects in the classroom that, you know, really, you know, can't uh, do much. Uh, they are a very, very, very valuable resource in that particular instance and, and etc. Uh, well, without further ado, I think we're going to, I think we have time. We do have some time about maybe for like me, these one or two questions, because I know we've, we've been answering questions along the way, but it would be great if you have a couple of questions now that we would be willing to, you know, Anna Maria or even myself would be willing to talk about it right now. So any ideas, any questions or comments before? I know we had some ideas about before earlier about the parents, not a problem now, but uh, what are some other things that are popping up on your end? What are some of the challenges maybe that uh, we did not cover, I should say today, uh, um, that you maybe have on your mind that you would love to, to bring up and discuss? As always, as always, you know, we're going to the while, while, while waiting for, I guess, the wheels, the, the turn and and for that energy, that that liquid coverage to, to get organized, you know, for us to ask a couple of questions. You can turn on your microphones if you want um, at this moment, at this stage in, in the presentation. Uh, activate your microphones if you want so you can maybe interact and talk a bit more with Anna Maria. Uh, so Angie tells us what. Um, I would love to read regarding thinking routines. Could you please repeat the author? Uh, for me, Anna, if you have it there, we can maybe copy and stick it in there for us. That would be great. Yes. Yes. So thinking routines. Um, I would highly recommend the Project Zero website. If you'll hold on just a second, I will bring it up and uh, post it there in the in the chat. OK, OK. And there is a book by Daniel Wilson and others, which is called. Visible thinking. And of course, Ron Richard, his website is also a major source of information. Okay. Any other as questions I out there? pull yes. those, yeah, as sure. I pull those up, please feel free to share other questions and well, as and I'm not, I'm not sure if you know, but I'm going to go ahead and give you guys some ideas. Uh, the presentation we had tonight is going to be sent out to you guys by tomorrow. Adriana is going to be sending that out to you guys. Uh, in addition to, we have a new newsletter we just started uh, last, I think, about three weeks ago. So we have a new newsletter that's going to be coming out. And in the new letter that's coming out, again, tomorrow's edition, uh, we will have a little small section here related to young learners. So be sure to, once again, if you're already subscribed to our webinars, uh, you, you're also going to be receiving the newsletters. Uh, it's the same population, it's the same individuals. Hopefully check your spam. I hope it's not going to be there. But the idea is that uh, in hopes of uh, like again getting the word out in hopes of actually taking the conversation a bit further than just you know a 45 or 60 minute little talk the idea once again at the beginning I it's all about trying to build community trying to build and establish a community out there so that we can once again look for additional opportunities for us to talk to interact and do some other things as well uh, your voice is very important as well as you know what we are doing at the university in terms of researching in terms of writing and interacting with I should say scholars um, practitioners and colleagues throughout Colombia. Uh, so it's it's really for us beneficial to see each and every one of you. It's also really rewarding to see, you know, some former students, some actual students, even colleagues as well, that's connected to these different types of spots. Uh, like I said again in the beginning, uh, in the event that, you know, you do not have uh, Anna Marie is going to be sending you a link with the resources. Uh, if you link, could you copy the link again in there, Anna? Just because I think it got lost at the very top. So if you can just sure. co copy the link again, that would be great. Uh, she's going to be sending the, the link here, but also in the newsletter that we get received tomorrow, as well as the email you're going to receive, you're going to get the email. Uh, you're going to receive the the PowerPoint. You're also going to receive I said, the video of today's session. And um, Anna, for those of us who have actually responded in the chat box relating to you know wanting to get a, a complimentary copy now, it's a draft version of the manual they're working on. Um, once again, uh, you know we're always looking for feedback. So this is something. These are initiatives that you know we're taking on uh, with colleagues with in the in the program students, uh, actual candidates in the master's program in order to get the word out. Because like I said, again, we're all doing something that's beneficial. We're all doing something that can, we can give back to the community. It's not just about what I do in my class and it's good for me and that's it. Sure, 
I'm doing something awesome in my class, but if I can share it with you, maybe you're doing something even similar or even better. And if we join forces, can you imagine the ecosystem within your own school, within your own grades, and within the entire, I should say, educational system here, we are off to a really, really, really good start. That's the goal. That's what we're trying to get out there for us. So in the event that you do not, you didn't get a chance to look at the entire webinar, Remember all of the webinars we have done so far between May and June. You can find them here at this particular link. Uh, if not, like I said again, you're going to be receiving that information. Uh, we're always looking for new ideas and things that need for us to 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 I should say get together. So we hope that you have really enjoyed the session that we had for for us tonight. Uh, Anna Maria, thank you very much for for your time. Thank you for all the all the insights that you provided. She provided some really cool information. Not really cool. I, well, sounds a bit. I should say my my way of my rate of speech sometimes is a bit crazy. I am also very um, I should say uh, not protocol like. So I say words and I say things that people are like. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. Yes, I. You're said really it. cool, um, Jermaine. <laughs> You're really cool. Oh my gosh! No, 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 no! Don't make fun of me. Don't make fun of me, Anna. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> I'm laughing with you, not at you. Muy bien, muy bien, my dear. Good. So with that in mind. Uh, we want to thank you once again for for being here with us tonight, uh, having some time to spend with Anna Maria, Jermaine McDougall, uh, on behalf of the master's program in English language teaching. Um, we you know it's it's really great to have all of you here connected from six o'clock to seven o'clock. I know we've had a very long day. Uh, it, it's been very challenging time these last few weeks, few months. And so once again, we're looking forward to seeing you guys hopefully next week. Uh, we get a chance to talk some more. And well, um, Anna, I don't know if you have something else that you'd like to say or add, uh, because if not, I think we can go ahead and, and bring um, our little space, a little time for tonight to an end. Uh, keep in mind, if you want to connect with Anna Maria, um, please be sure to do so. Uh, just let me put that information up here. I thought it was already here. I apologize. Let me go ahead and get the contact budget. information. So that, there you go. So make sure that you get an opportunity to 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 get in touch with Anna Maria if you want. Um, she's like she's a very very active user in in Twitter. Like she said again, she's got her own team of individuals out there getting things done. But once again, we can also join a conversation with her in in Facebook. We can join a conversation with her in Twitter. And once again, we can also take that conversation over to LinkedIn. So like again, like I said again, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, on behalf of uh, the master's program. University of Savannah and English language teaching. We want to thank you for being here and well, I think we are done for tonight and thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Jermaine. Thank you, everyone. It's been a fantastic audience and yes, please feel free to contact me. My email address is there and um, it was fantastic to see you.